So just a bit of a quick introduction. So yes, I work in robotics. I work with robots, as a matter of fact. And I work with robots to make it easy for you to work with robots. So this is what we call human-robot interaction. And that's why my talk is actually titled Living with Truly Intelligent Machines. So how many of you own a Roomba? I'm guessing some of you do. And how many of you actually sometimes really hate your Roomba? Because it's getting tangled in the carpet or you know, running after your cat and gobbling up things that it shouldn't. So yeah, that's not a really truly intelligent machine. It's a step towards the right direction. But I like to take robots not just on the carpets or anywhere else in the rooms. I want to take them outdoors. So that's what I work in field robotics. The word field is generally used to think about cornfields. Maybe you're thinking about, oh, agriculture. You have um, automated you know, harvesters or something of that sort. Maybe, but not me. Um, I work with these things that actually swim. And they go into the lakes and the oceans and the rivers of, of the world, essentially. So where have we been? Um, we've been to the lakes in Minnesota. Uh, lake, uh, well, we want to come go to even more, like Lake Superior and other places. Nokomis was our target last year, and we did this. Um, we've been to the Caribbean a couple of times, actually more than a couple of times. Um, we've been to the North Pole, as a matter of fact, as well. Um, well, inside the Arctic Circle, not on the North Pole, but close enough. So if you look at this globe, this is, by the way, the planet as it stands today. And it should stand like this. And we have to care that it actually stands like this, this blue, blue orb. Otherwise, well, I wouldn't be here now. The stars that you're looking at right now are the places that we've been. By we, I mean myself, my robots, and my students. Uh, and you might be wondering why. So I yeah, will carry on, and I'll probably answer that question as to why. Um, I came from Canada. And Canada is um, a big country with a very small population and has the landscape that most mimics extraterrestrial um, habitations. Actually, that's true. So we went to the very up um, top of the planet up there in a place called the Axel Heiberg on the 82nd degree north parallel um, to basically work with our colleagues in astrobiology to see if we can find microorganisms up there. So it's pretty high up there, and this is what it looks like in July. So if you're wondering that this is all oh, wonderful, beautiful, uh, well, this is July, and this is how it is. There's still a lot of ice on the ground. And it's not somewhere you have an airport. So my next slide actually had a couple of videos on them, which I'm not going to show right now for the sake of time. But we basically crash land onto a muddy beach. But this is what I, what I really get excited about. So robotics is an all-encompassing phrase. It means you know, if you look at Hollywood, you think about Transformers, you think about data um, from Star Trek or, or um, Star Wars, C-3PO, and, and all those characters, humanoids mostly. That's a goal, but we don't really care about robots looking like humans. We care about robots working with humans. We care about robots that can actually understand what it's looking at, that can understand what you're saying without having an advanced degree in robotics or computer science for that matter, or something that can understand your habits and get better at uh, working with you. All of those things, that's what we basically care about. So why do I really like robotics? Well, as a scientist and as an engineer, as a... Um, math person, I like it because it has clean theory. It's well understood. Um, you can actually physically realize and test this. You can ask Jay about this, and he uh, did some of that work himself last year. Uh, and it also gives us an insight into human cognition. How do we see things? How do we understand? How do we learn? We actually have a mathematical and a computational model of those things, so that's really useful. Why would you like it? Because it makes your life convenient and safe. It makes our economy stronger, and it brings in a lot of um, competitive and prosperity, uh, competitiveness and prosperity, and in some cases actually overcomes human limitations. And that's one of the things that I actually am going into now, to make robotics useful for people with physical and cognitive disabilities. And so how how can you live better, and how can you live longer, and have a more fulfilled and enriched life? So that's what we're actually going after. So this is the theme of my work: human and robot coexistence which means that we have to have robots and people work safely and without killing each other, essentially. If you go to an automated car plant, and if you look at how these humongous robots are making cars, Tesla comes to mind. Their Fresno factory is fully automated, no human beings, only robots. That's because you can actually keep those two things together. Um, robots are large and huge and very powerful. So if you're in the wrong arc, or in the arc of the robot's movement, then that's the last place you'll ever be. Um, <laughs> That's true, actually, because these robots are picking up entire cars. Um, maybe you want to work with a robot to fix a door on a car, and you ask for a screwdriver, and the robot doesn't know where you are, and it really gives it to you <laughs> in a bad way. Um, right? 
so uh, there's many, the, the jokes that just write themselves. So I don't really want to get there. <laughs> a, as funny as it sounds, this is the challenge, that we can't have robots unless it's, unless it's a Roomba or um, a pool cleaning robot work together with humans. Most of the robots are in a cage. People are elsewhere, they're protected, there are laser beams surrounding these robots. So if anybody crosses that line, robots shut down. But we have needs. We have needs where robots should actually work together, and we actually do this, and we do this underwater with scuba divers. So um, that by itself sounds like an exciting, um, fascination, fascinating pro uh, proposition, but there are challenges. Number one challenge is, uh, how do I get my clicker to work? There we go. Uh, we have to plan for this, right? The clicker and also the human-robot coexistence bit. Um, like right now, I'm here, you guys are paying attention, or maybe not, but um, I'm not gonna go back there and see. But robots actually have to be put through very specific, very strict rules that they cannot break. People, you cannot do that with them. I mean, if you put a robot, I mean, the people who use their Roombas, you know that, right? You are frustrated with your Roombas because sometimes it doesn't do what you need it to do. It won't get on a black carpet because it thinks it's the end of the world and it will just back out of it. Um, but then you tape its sensors with tape, close their eyes, and you think, okay, now it's working on the carpets, but then it's gonna fall down the stairs. So these are the frustrations we often feel, but rules are rules for robots. We cannot not change them. We just cannot willy-nilly decide to rule, uh, break our rules and expect the robots are going to work with us. Self-driving cars are the next big thing, and you hear about that every single day. Tesla's making autopilot and lane keep assist and God knows what else. I personally am not keen on getting on those things because I know what's actually the state of the art is and I know a little bit of rain or Minnesota snow is gonna throw your lane keep assist out of the window. So that's something else we're working on uh, with the um, help of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Can these lane keep assist things work in the snow? Yes, yeah, so we have to plan for these things. How do you make about intelligent HRI, which means human robot interaction? So here's where computer science comes in. You write grammar, language rules. You know, as human languages have rules, what makes a sentence, what doesn't. Same things uh, apply to computer science languages. If it's Python, if it's C, or if it's something that you cook up in your lab to talk to robots. We call this RoboChat. This is basically a, what you're looking at is the grammar of how a human being can actually, quote unquote, talk to a robot with hand gestures. And then you go down in the water with robots and then you talk to these robots using symbolic languages like those. Um, make sure that the robot actually understands what you're trying to tell it before it actually does it. Like my previous mentor used to have this joke about a robot chef, you know, somebody who cooks for you, and you have a weekend party going on, and you say, hey, Mr. Robot, why don't you come and make sure all the, ro all the guests are filled? Except that in the noise of things, it hears make sure that all their guests are killed. Well, the end result is going to be you're going to have no more friends. Um, but then again, the, the outcomes of that is disastrous, right? So this is what we don't want to happen. We want to make sure that the robot does what, she, what it hears, but if it's dangerous, it asks you about it before it does it. Right? So we have to ensure safety. That's, that's super important. But before even we get in the water, we have to have people like Chris, one of my friends and colleagues, come up here and test these things out in what we call a user interface study. So some of you have used Windows 8. That number seems to be very small because it really wasn't a very popular operating system um, because it didn't really appeal to people. Now, but then Windows 10 came along, everybody loves it and uses it. So this is what we're doing here. Is this something that really you're gonna use or not? So this is what we call UI testing. So once that's done, we do some ruggedization. Can we stand on this robot and can it go down to 150 feet of water depth? So imagine your physics, 150 feet of water depth is actually quite a bit of pressure. So the two of us together standing on this thing is literally nothing for this robot to withstand. And it survives, right? So nothing happens to it. So then you put everything together and see how everything works out there in the oceans and the lakes and the rivers. So the goal, alongside working with these robots and these rules and everything, okay, we have a method, we have robots that work underwater. Can we make these things work elsewhere? What do you mean by elsewhere? Well, robots swimming with fish and counting you know, species together with um, human beings. Or driving down downtown Minneapolis where you actually don't see lanes because you know, hey, we have two seasons, right? Construction and winter. So this is our other season. Um, the picture on the left, you don't see any lanes because that's the real thing. 
the picture on the right, you do see a big yellow line showing up. That's because we hallucinated that. Well, it's not wild hallucination. It's actually computational hallucination, if I could call it that. Because we compute where the lanes should be, and we project that so you can actually see where you're going on the road, even if it's covered with snow. Right? So this is what we're going after. The same technology that works underwater works over on the streets of Minnesota. And it also works if you have a robot assistant in your home, and you don't want it to bother you, and it wanted it, it want to figure out what's the right time to bother you and what's not. So the robot comes close to you and says, hmm, Junaid seems busy. Maybe he's watching Netflix. I should probably not bug him this time. And it just goes away because I'm not paying attention. I'm not looking at the robot. Now, of course, if this robot comes to you, you'd probably scream because you're not used to a 400-pound, 6-foot, 2-inch long robot coming up to you and then standing next to you and stare at you, but for no good reason because you're not used to it. But hopefully you will be. Uh, maybe not six foot two with 400 pounds, but you'll get there. So um, what are the challenges? What are the questions that we still have to answer? Well, lots of them. We have challenges everywhere. First of all, if you don't have a, um, well, if you don't know how to use a screwdriver, going back to the screwdriver point again, and if you have uh, forgotten to put in all the screws on your robot and you throw it into the lake, there'll be water outside and inside. And uh, those of you who use electronics, which is, I think, everyone, you do understand that water and electronics do not really mix well together. So that's one challenge, right? That's a real big challenge. Again, I'm faced with the clicker challenge one more time. And I'm pressing the right button. OK, so we have a technical. I could go on. I actually know what's after this. So oh, there we go. Um, this uh, feature has been around in the field, uh, in, the liter in, in the news a lot these days. You, you hear about the boom of AI, and how we are living in the generation where AI is going to take over, quote unquote, everything. What is this AI that's actually suddenly burst out of nowhere? Actually, it's not been nowhere. It's been around for the last 50 years or so. But it hasn't been effective because till like 10 years ago, we didn't know how really to computationally model the way our brain works. To be honest, we still don't. We really still don't know that. But we know somewhat better. So the phrase deep learning, uh, it's actually an abbreviation that stands for deep neural nets. So neural network stands, comes from the, the policy that our brains are a, co a collection of neurons that are connected together, and we can think in parallel, and we can, we can see and sense and do things in parallel. So this is an effort to do this, this mimicry of the brain, so that in the old days, like we used to do, We'd look at pictures of pandas, and we'd ask people, what makes a panda a panda? And you'd answer, looks like a bear, has black and white features, eats bamboos, lives in China, speaks Mandarin. <laughs> I almost caught you guys there. No, it doesn't, right? But that's not a feature of a panda. But you'd probably come up with different features of pandas as they go along. So that's our old school machine learning. And old school, it's really not that old school. It's about two decades old. Now, what deep learning does is all it says is give me millions of pictures of pandas and don't tell me what makes a panda a panda. I will figure this out myself. And it does that. It does that brilliantly. It does that so well that when you upload your photos to Google Plus or Google Photos or Apple Photos or iPhotos, it finds pictures of you from 20 years ago. Well, not all of you had 20 years ago existence, so <laughs> pardon that, no, I'm old. Um, but then it finds your photos from 20 years ago and says, oh, this is you. And I don't look anything like what I used to 20 years ago, or neither did my parents. And it finds that amazingly well. Photo recognition, image recognition, um, drug discovery, weather forecasting, financial models, all of these things have been benefiting greatly from the advent of deep learning. So it's been pretty good. It just learns useful things by itself. So you don't have to tell somebody what a car looks like. Nobody needs to extract what, I, what we call features out of these car images. Deep learning does that by itself. So this is what the boom stands like these days. Back in the 60s and the 50s, we were doing AI for playing checkers. Back in the 90s, Deep Blue with Garry Kasparov, some of you might remember this, made the news because it beat a human grandmaster for the very first time. That was IBM. Now IBM also uses something called Watson, which plays Jeopardy, and some of you might have seen that. Um, but that last decade, as I was pointing at, has really exploded 
in our faces. So all this lane key persists that you're looking at in autonomous driving that you're looking at to medical sciences, to cancer discover, cancer cure, and all those things that are being did, like really worked on. Open, open the, deep learning has opened doors for us, which it really didn't in the past. And we are users of that as well. So what do we do? How, are, uh, how is AI helping us? Well, clicker problem again. And how is AI in robotics? I think we missed a slide there, but that's fine. Um, it's in the, on the rise in deep learning. Um, robotics is a big user of deep learning as well. And we're using this uh, in our lab, which is now called the Interactive Robotics and Vision Lab. That's our Twitter handle. We have to have a Twitter handle these days. Otherwise, nobody reads your research. Um, <laughs> We do deep learning for the deep. I had to throw that sentence out there as well. Um, how? Um, if the slide ever moves, you should see this. There we go. We take images on the, on the left column. This is what, you see, what things look like underwater with the haze and the tint and everything else. And then we make them look like the ones on the right. And it automatically does that. It understands things, understands how things should look like if you just removed all the water. Now, you see there's a challenge there. You can't take a fish like that, or a shark like that, or coral like that, and just take them out of the water, and take pictures, and teach the AI that, look, this is what it looks like if there is no water. Because then it basically contradicts our performance, our, our needs, that, that kills the fish, kills the coral, and so on and so forth. We'll learn to actually not need that, and still be able to clear up what we want to, uh, want to do, so that our robots can actually see better and see clearer underwater. Um, we've learned to do hand gesture recognition. So instead of using your cue cards or printed codes, you can just go underwater and use hand gestures to talk to robots. And we're doing this right now. Um, so you can go together and look at fish. You can go together and look at pipelines if there is, God forbid, an oil leak happening. You can work together with human scuba divers to fix that with robots. Um, we're still addressing a lot of issues. This is actually a Tesla. Model S, and the picture was, this was me in the tunnels of Duluth, terrified in the back seat because the car was driving itself. Um, but it was driving fairly well, even in the darkness and the shade. So it was quite impressive. So we need answers to a number of issues. Safety, interoperability, human interaction, and of course, privacy. Um, how much should the AI know, and how much should the AI know about ourselves? We have to answer those questions.